Welcome to the bookstore. Today's book summary is on the book, 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. Rule number one, stand up straight with your shoulders back. The denial of a profound truth can lead to suffering. Denying your responsibility to deal with suffering can lead to the hopeless victim mentality. This mentality is increasingly common and relies on an expectation that others will solve your problems. Adopting this approach prevents you from finding meaning. Some of the strongest people have overcome massive amounts of pain, suffering and adversity. Taking ownership of their suffering allowed them to find meaning. On top of mentality, though, our body posture is crucial. To learn to stand up for yourself, Peterson uses the metaphor of embracing your inner lobster. The lobster shares many of the same neurological structures as humans. Like human brains. Lobster brains have areas specialized for social hierarchies. Peterson explains that studies suggest lobsters who lose their social status through losing fights stop producing serotonin. This lack of serotonin can lead to depression in the lobsters. The dominant lobsters also adopted a strong posture, while the other lobsters curled up. The body and mind are deeply connected. So, set yourself up for success by exerting the proper body language. Stand up straight with your shoulders. Back for two powerful reasons. 1. It exerts dominance and confidence. 2. It also shows you accept responsibility. Research has shown that physical stature, even a small muscle movement, can affect your emotions. It's tough to accept responsibility for your actions when your slouching are sprawled out on the floor. By being upright with your shoulders back and your feet shoulder width apart, you exude confidence and a willingness to take meaningful action. Rule number two. Treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. Peterson encourages people to credit themselves in those around them for acting productively and with care. He also credits patients for showing genuine concern and thoughtfulness toward others. They can express their emotions because they are simply being themselves. When you are a patient, you simply accept that you are a patient. You don't try to be someone else. The lesson to learn from the patient approach is to respect yourself and know that you are worthy of help. You are important to other people, as much as you are to yourself. You have a vital role to play in the unfolding destiny of the world. As a result, you are morally obliged to take care of yourself. You should take care of, help, and be charitable to yourself. Act toward yourself in the same way you would take care of, help, and be dutiful to someone you love and value. As part of caring for yourself, you must determine where you will bargain for yourself so that you don't end up resentful, vengeful and cruel. You have to articulate your own principles for two reasons, so that you can defend yourself against others. Taking advantage of you, so that you are secure and safe while you work and play. When you look after yourself, you're able to start building meaning into your life. Don't underestimate the power of your vision and direction. These are irresistible forces. They can transform obstacles into open pathways and expanded opportunities. Rule number three. Make friends with people who want the best. For you, your friends have a significant impact on the way you behave. Their sayings and mannerisms will often rub off on you. This means they can also negatively influence you through toxic habits. But if you surround yourself with people who support your upward aim, they will not tolerate your cynicism and destructiveness. Instead, they will encourage you when you do good for yourself and others, and carefully punish you when you don't. This encouragement will help bolster your resolve. People who are not aiming upward will do the opposite. Peterson explains that managers often put underachievers on group projects with high performers. Their goal is to raise the underachievers up to the level of their colleagues. 
but research suggests that the opposite effect is more common. The high performers are likely to be dragged down to the underachievers level. So, strive to surround yourself with good people. Look beyond superficial features like sense of style or socioeconomic status and identify who will help you create positive change. It requires strength and courage to stand next to brilliant people like this because you might feel inferior. Have some humility and courage so you can grow as an individual. Rule number four. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. Find your being. Once you're an adult, you're a singular being. So, be cautious when comparing yourself to others. You have your own particular problems, financial, intimate and psychological. Those are embedded in the unique, broader context of your existence. Your career or job either does or does not personally work for you. If it does, it does so in a unique interplay with the other specifics of your life. As you find your being, you must decide how much of your time to spend on your career and how much on other parts of your life. You must also decide what to let go of and what to pursue. These decisions take careful observation, education, reflection, and communication with others. Essentially, by doing this, you are scratching the surface of your beliefs. This helps you to make decisions without feeling overwhelmed by your problems. Avoid comparing yourself to others. We all have an innate need to compare ourselves to other people. Your brain will release a hormone called serotonin upon noticing you are more skilled than others. When you have serotonin in your blood, you feel confident and in control of your life. But your brain restricts serotonin when someone threatens your status in society and makes you look incompetent. So, you will start doubting yourself and experience a low sense of self-worth. You are now connected to billions of people online. This means it doesn't take long for your brain to notice how you compare to other people. When you're exposed to so many better people, you're more inclined to lose hope. You will stop taking action and let your life slip into chaos. The best way to prevent this from happening is to stop comparing yourself to who someone else is today. Instead, start comparing yourself to who you were yesterday. Get your psychological house in order. Your psychological house is the most important thing to monitor and improve. Comparing yourself today to who you were yesterday is what Peterson calls taking stock of your psychological house. You can see the progress you have made and decide if you believe you're progressing at the required rate. You then need to identify where your psychological house must be renovated. Determine whether these changes are a cosmetic fix or a structural flaw. Write a list of these areas that require improvement and match them with fixes. This approach to improvement will help your internal critic become less obsessed with inadequacies and more focused on improvement. It is also an essential part of Peterson's sixth rule. Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world, so it clearly holds significant importance. Rule number five. Do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Parents have to treat their kids in a way that prepares them for the real world. For Peterson, this means ensuring they can function well in society by instilling the appropriate rules. When parents ignore this, their children risk being rejected by society in many painful ways. This can feel like a high-pressure challenge because our children are blank slates who will impact future generations. Deciding what to write onto these blank slates can be paralyzing. Peterson first encourages readers to accept the innate aggression found in humans. This is why almost everyone has a story of being bullied as a child. To overcome this aggression, the author believes your primary concern should be raising kind children. This doesn't mean you should become your child's best friend. This would prevent you from enforcing the required rules for your child to become a better person. 
Peterson provides the following examples of effective rules to set. Never use violence unless in self-defense. Show others kindness and respect. Peterson also recommends you avoid superficial rules like, you must always be in bed by 7 p.m. You must never have mismatched socks. As well as setting up rules that will guide children to a better future, parents must also learn how to help their children overcome failure and pain. These experiences are inevitable and should be used as a learning experience. Raise children who are passionate about changing the world and create children who seek to improve themselves so they are better equipped to change the world. Rule number six set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Before you complain about the world or your situation, you need to start small and consider your own circumstances. Have you taken full advantage of the opportunities offered to you? Are you working hard on your career? Or, are you letting bitterness and resentment hold you back and drag you down? Have you made peace with your brother? Are you treating your spouse and your children with dignity and respect? Do you have habits that are destroying your health and well-being? Have some humility. If you cannot bring peace to your household, then you are not equipped to rule a city. Let your soul guide you. Then watch what happens over the days in weeks after you have set your house in order. When you are at work, you will begin to say what you think. You will start to tell your wife, husband, children, or parents what you want and need. When you know that you have left something undone, you will act to correct this. Your head will start to clear up as you stop filling it with lies that everything is fine. Your experience will improve as you stop distorting it with inauthentic actions that don't address the problems you have in your house. Rule number seven. Pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Peterson uses the term expedient to describe putting off the activities we know we should do to seek short-term gratification instead. We do this because life is filled with suffering. But there's so much more to life than just suffering. So, try to enjoy life as much as you can by pursuing something meaningful. Pursuing meaning will help you be a better and happier person while also helping you deal with suffering. You can start doing this by seeking sacrifice rather than instant gratification. This sacrifice must be for the benefit of others rather than your own benefit. 4. Example, Peterson does not see working long hours to earn a promotion as a sacrifice because your actions are still motivated by a positive outcome for yourself. Peterson explains that these small, positive impacts will help you grow like a lotus flower. These flowers start at the bottom of a muddy lake and slowly grow. Eventually, lotus flowers burst out beautifully in the sunlight. This is how sacrifice for the sake of others can make your life far more fulfilling in the future. Rule number 8. Tell the truth, or, at least, don't lie. You can use words to manipulate the world into delivering what you want. This includes both lying to others and lying to yourself. But this approach is driven by an ill-formed desire that doesn't consider the negative impact. Suppose. You pay close attention to what you do and say. In that case, you can learn to feel a state of internal division and weakness when you are misbehaving and misspeaking. This is an embodied sensation, not a thought. But if you bend everything blindly and willfully toward a goal, you will never discover if another goal would serve better. As you continue to live by the truth, you will have to accept and deal with the conflicts that this mode of being will generate. If you do so, you will continue to mature and become more responsible, in small and large ways. You will approach your more wisely formulated goals and become even wiser, as you discover and rectify your inevitable errors. Rule number 9. Assume the person you are listening to might know something you don't. Listen rather than judge. A listening person can reflect the crowd. He can do that without talking. 
He lets the talking person listen to themselves. That is what Freud recommended. Freud had his patients lay on a couch, look at the ceiling, let their minds wander, and say whatever. Wandered in. That's his method of free association. Freudian psychoanalysts used this method to avoid transferring their biases and opinions into the patient's internal landscape. If you listen instead, without premature judgment, people will generally tell you everything they are thinking, and with little deceit. People will tell you the most amazing, absurd and intriguing details. Few of your conversations will be boring. What you know now is not enough. Unless your life is perfect, what you know is not enough. You remain threatened by disease, self-deception, unhappiness, malevolence, betrayal, corruption, pain and limitation. You are subject to all these factors because you are just too ignorant to protect yourself. If you knew enough, you could be healthier and more honest. You would suffer less. You could recognize, resist and even triumph over malice and evil. You would neither betray a friend nor deal falsely and deceitfully in business, politics or love. Your current knowledge has neither made you perfect nor kept you safe. So, it is insufficient. For this reason, the priestess of the Delphic Oracle in ancient Greece spoke most highly of Socrates. Socrates always sought the truth. She described him as the wisest living man. Because he knew that what he knew was nothing. So, assume the person you are listening to might know something you don't. Rule number 10. Be precise in your speech. When we have a problem, we are often tempted to cover it up or hope the problem will go away by itself. It's easier to keep peace and avoid the anxiety, despair and sadness that are associated with confronting your problems. It's easier to pretend the problem doesn't exist than to admit it does and accept the pain. But that's not an effective solution. So, whenever you plan to achieve something, you must be explicit and precise in your goals. Unclear goals can create unclear actions, which then can create unclear results. If you have a vague unease, you will struggle with it until you define it explicitly and give it a concrete form. Once you precisely identify the issue, you will likely realize you were far more afraid than you should have been. You now have a specific target to confront, and specificity lets you start challenging the chaos. Rule number 11. Do not bother children when they are skateboarding. Peterson believes that parenting affects how children react to danger. In the future, parents will often encourage their children to do something safer than skateboarding or rock climbing. The author believes that pushing children away from these activities means they will struggle to face the dangers of the adult world. Peterson also considered gender equality in this chapter. He believes that there is a growing desire in modern society for gender equality. So, he highlights the difference between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. When gender equality means equal opportunity, rights and treatment, this is good. But equality of opportunity should not be achieved at the cost of equality of outcome. According to 12 Rules for Life, the idea of literal, complete equality is not supported by biology. It could be counterproductive because it forces people against their nature. Rule number 12. Pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. Peterson admits that it is easy to focus on the ugly parts of life. After all, some examples of suffering can feel completely overwhelming. He uses the example of his daughter's lifelong struggle with severe arthritis. The easy option with these crises is to become nihilistic or negative about everything. The reality is that this approach can often be worse than the initial suffering. To counteract potential nihilism, pay close attention to the love and beauty around you. This might be a sunset, flowers, or simply giving a cat a stroke. Dwell on these moments when you can to increase their impact. Life's too short to suffer. 
So here we come to the end of this book summary. Thank you for listening to the bookstore. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and like the video. Later.